Okay, thanks, everybody. thanks everybody for coming. Um, so today we have Jake Turley from Bristol and National University of Singapore. He's going to tell us about deep learning and wound healing. Uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so I'm supervised by Isaac and Tani and my PhD and finished in the summer, uh, but I was also supervised by um, uh, Paul Martin and Helen Weavers, who are my biology supervisors. And yeah, together we were looking at deep learning, uh, not deep learning, wound healing using deep learning. Um, and the aspect of wound healing we were studying is re That's a bit where the, the wound closes over with epithelial cells covering the wound. Um, this is a key step during wound healing, as without this, wounds left open and exposed. Um, and this could lead to further damage of tissue from the environment or from pathogens. Um, and without proper re in the clinic, wounds can become chronic and fail to heal. And this is not only expensive and difficult to treat, also has a severe negative impact on a patient's quality of life. Um, so we use the Drosophila pupil wing as the tissue we investigate uh, and wound. Uh, this is because pupae are, uh, Drosophila are highly genetically tractable and pupae are translucent and remain stationary so we can get these long-term high quality images like you see of this, of wounds closing. Um, and we require these high quality images so that we can apply tools such as uh, deep learning to pull out information. But before I tell you about those, I first want to talk about mammalian wound healing. Uh, this is a paper from a few years ago from uh, Valentina Greco's lab. Um, and they were looking at the cell behaviors involved in uh, reorganization in mice wounds. Um, and yes, yeah, so they did this using a transgenic mice and they would make a hole punch wound uh, in the back of the ear of a juvenile mice. And this uh, mouse had uh, histone 2B labeled with uh, GFP so they can fluorescently image this, uh, these uh, nuclei. So yeah, that labels the nuclei over here. Uh, and then they could do, which is, the kind of very impressive thing, do live imaging on the animal. Um, and from those images, they could do things like tracking nuclei and you know they'd make a wound here. And then they could track these nuclei over time and see how far uh, and where they were migrating. And they found that cells closest to this wound would migrate the furthest and this would decay as you move further back. Uh, they could also observe these cell divisions. Uh, and they found that these divisions didn't hurt, like didn't happen in the first uh, sort of 0.4 millimeter around this wound edge, and they were largely confined to a sort of annulus about half a millimeter to a millimeter back from that wound edge. Um, they also found that these cell divisions were uh, they divided in a biased manner, dividing towards this wound. Um, and then finally, they kind of briefly looked at cell shape and found that these cells were elongated uh, and pointing towards um, these wounds. Um, so we'd like to investigate these three cell behaviors in uh, more detail in our model. We have some benefits as that we can make more uh, repeats using flies than you could uh, for sort of technical and ethical reasons in mice. Uh, we also have more genetic tools within uh, Drosophila that we're able to use. Um, and we can you know, study things like cell shape much easier than in these models. Um, so yes, yeah, so we use uh, Drosophila to, uh, uh, and we look at the pupil wing. Um, we need to first to look at these pupil wings, we need to dissect to remove this outer casing uh, to reveal our nice transparent pupae underneath. And here's some pictures of Isaac and Tani having a go, uh, I think a year ago or something, uh, dissecting some of those pupae. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty good fun. Um, so yeah, once dissected, we can mount the whole animal on an imaging dish and then take this over to the microscope to image. Uh, so it's a living uh, whole animal um, that will you know, wound, we can wound it and it will keep it alive and uh, it will grow to be a nice, normal, healthy adult. Um, so it's a live animal. Um, so yeah, so we here use a transgenic uh, fly with uh, e cadherin labeled with GFP and this has to see the cell boundaries in green and histone 2 is labeled with RFP so we can see these cell nuclei. Yeah. So the wing is a single layer of epithelium. It's a very flat surface uh, like here. And then we can make a wound in the center of this wing in a, a reproducible location. 
Um, and yeah, so we reduce the location and we make our wounds using uh, a laser ablation system. Uh, this gives us reasonably reproducible wounds um, and uh, sterile ones as well. Um, the wounds, uh, so, uh -huh, I will, oh wait, in the next slide, <laughs> we'll have some pictures of wounds. Um, but yeah, so here's a, just a, uh, the 3D sort of flip around of the wing. So you see the flat surface there, and just kind of all goes around on the other side. Um, and inside the wing, there is hemolymph, which is insect blood. It's full of immune cells and fat cells. Um, so yeah, the first thing we quantified was uh, uh, wounds. Uh, so we make two types, these large wounds and small wounds. The large wounds uh, are about 40, um, 40 microns in diameter, and the small wounds are about, uh, uh, I think about 15. Ooh, can't remember it off the top of my head. Probably can work it out from the area, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, these small wounds take about 25 minutes to heal, whereas the large wounds take about 45 to 50 minutes to heal. Um, and yeah, we can get lots of these repeats of these uh, wounds more than you maybe would do in sort of other systems. Um, and in each image, there's about a thousand cells. Uh, we image every uh, two minutes for three hours. Uh, so about 90 odd uh, frames. Um, and then this, this all together makes a very large data set full of you know, tens of thousands, uh, I think millions uh, of cells that all need their shape measuring and the uh, velocity measuring and things like that. Um, so we need to do this uh, in an automated manner as doing any of this by hand would be practically impossible. Um, so the first cell behavior that we uh, automated the quantification of is this cell migration. We did this using an existing plugin uh, called Trapmate uh, on Fiji. Uh, this in 3D identifies each of these nuclei in the tissue uh, through all the time points and then using a single particle tracking algorithm. It strings them all together, making these nice tracks. Um, and you can see that you know when we have our wounded one here, this is the wound boundary and cells over time move in towards this wound, helping close it up. We are to track and quantify that. Uh, the second cell behavior uh, was a bit more difficult to uh, quantify accurate, accurately. Um, so this is for determining the cell shapes. A uh, sort of common way of doing this is, is taking, um, so I, I should have mentioned this earlier actually, uh, when we do our microscopy, we take a 3D stacks um, of the image in both the ECAT here and the, the cell boundary and nucleus channel. Um, so in these cases, we're going to flatten our 3D stack into a 2D image, and then we can uh, extract out these, uh, get an image like this one. Um, so a common way of turning these images into cell boundaries, which we can then use to measure cell shape, is by applying a tissue, uh, a watershed algorithm. Um, and we do this using a plugin, a good one, tissue analyzer. Um, but when we do this just on kind of focused images, um, these cell boundaries don't look very nice and they kind of uh, have a lot of errors when we compare this to hand corrected data. Um, so we needed to improve this because due to the millions of cells we're imaging, we can't go through and hand correct all of these. Uh, I think it'd be a bit of a nightmare. Um, so we then decided to add in this extra step and use a deep learning algorithm, which is a type of AI uh, machine learning algorithm. Um, this algorithm is learnt uh, to first identify these cell boundaries, and this produces a much nicer, cleaner images than the ones before. And then we can apply our watershed algorithm onto these uh, nicer images, and we get nice, clear boundaries, uh, which do have some errors, but significantly less. Uh, and particularly, this does a much better job around wound edges, where we're kind of you know, most interested in stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the basal, the basal surface is, uh, yeah, yeah, so fine. So Kateran therefore is on the bottom? Yes, so the Kateran is on the surface here and the basal section here and we have key limbs below.
you say something about the like the projection or yeah, exactly. Yes, we're just looking at the AFCO surface here. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do have a basement membrane in the bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as we so to maximize the amount of information going into our deep learning model, um, we decided to not only use just this focused image here, the one that the pixels that are most in focus in this uh, stack but also include, uh, because we get some signal above and below that, uh, you know, sort of a few slices in the, in the microscope have the signal in. So we decided to include this, so the pixels above the most in focus plane, or no, above and below even, and we can combine these together into a red, green, blue image, which is this one here, uh, which has all three of those you know, layers of inf information, and this also boosted our uh, accuracy in our model. Uh, so we measured this um, uh, using uh, sort of these metrics. So a true positive will be if you've correctly identified a cell boundary. A false positive is if you've uh, the algorithm has added in an additional boundary that shouldn't be there. So you've artificially made two extra cells when there should just be one, and obviously the the shapes are all wrong. And a false negative would be if a, a boundary is missing and the cells are um, yeah, two cells have been merged together. Uh, so using kind of the standard method, which people then normally go hand edit, um, we got a, an F score, which combines each of these three measures uh, of 0 0.8, uh, 0.78, sorry. Um, but then after applying his deep learning algorithm first, we get a much higher accuracy. And we felt that this is sufficiently good. We then can use this to measure these cell boundaries uh, and shapes around our wounds. Um, so once we've first identified the cell boundaries, we need to quantify their shape. We do this by, for each cell in our image, we identify a contour and then can simply fit a polygon to each of the contours. And this is just uh, yeah, an ideal form uh, for us to then apply these measures that are really easy to do for polygons. You can mix all the maths quite a lot easier. Um, our main measure for cell shape is going to be this Q tensor. Um, it's a second rank matrix, uh, symmetrical, obviously, and um, it stores information about both the uh, cell elongation in this Q naught here and the uh, orientation of the cell shape uh, in theta. Yeah, and it's a pneumatic as well. Should have said that earlier. Um, uh, so, relative to the long axis of the wing, so the, along the kind of the blade region. So is that again? That's a... Yeah, exactly. And also at other points, we will actually do that for most of the talk, we'll actually measure it relative to the center of a wound so that um, we can then sort of determine whether the cells are pointing towards the wound or you know, perpendicular to the center of the wound and things like that. So that's actually yeah, what we'll be using our frames reference for most of this um, for. Uh, so yeah, in this, we can visualize some of these cell behaviors. Um, so in these, and what will be video, we have uh, sort of uh, blue dots um, for each cell identified, uh, or nucleus identified even, uh, and red lines indicate the speed and the direction the cells are moving. Uh, so we'll play this movie and you'll see that these cells rushing into this uh, section of the wound. You see them all kind of moving into this bit, kind of moving in from sides and stuff and closing up quite quickly. Um, we can do the same with our cell shape. Um, so again, so we've got our cell boundaries in green around here, and these lines indicate the orientation of the cells and the length of the line is proportional to the elongation. So we've got some very round cells here, um, that are very long, but some very elongated ones down here. Um, and yeah, so we can measure these relative to, uh, yeah, we can measure these cell shapes relative to this wound center here. Uh, so in this image, cells that are dark blue are elongated perpendicular to the center of this wound and cells that are pointing towards the wound would appear in red. Um, but as you can see that the vast majority of these cells are somewhat blue with some highly elongated cells around this 
uh, edge of this wound. Uh, and when I play this movie, we'll see that those cells are going to round up. They're going to lose their sort of blue color. Um, and we get a much more kind of uniform, or no, not uniform, but like a paler picture. Um, so these are kind of changing their shapes. It's going to help me close up this wound. We're now getting, yeah, a lot more rounder cell shapes around the edge here. Um, and yeah, this kind of closes up. So we can quantify this. I'm sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, this one here. Yes, yeah, yeah. So at the end of the uh, wound closure process, so we quantify the uh, wound closure process up to 20% uh, of the original size of the wound um, because in this system, the leading edge cells then uh, dissolve their boundaries and fuse and yeah, become poly um, But yeah, so that's not so much relevant for the kind of mammalian side. So we kind of stop our uh, quantification of wounds at that point. But yeah. Um, cool. So yeah, we can quantify this across uh, all of our uh, repeats um, and for yeah, average out all of our uh, measures for our velocity in this case. Um, oh, the colors don't come up very well. Um, but so in these heat maps here, we have distance from the wound edge. Uh, so we split the tissue and bend it up into these different annuluses, and then you have time after wounding. Um, you can see that uh, in this heat map, blue regions are where cells are moving away from the wound on average, and red is moving towards the wound. So we catch a little bit of the end of the recall uh, that happens just after wounding, uh, when there's sort of tensions released. Uh, but then after this period, we see uh, red zones where the cells are on average migrating towards this wound. Uh, in the large wounds, hopefully the colors are clearish, um, in the large wounds, you can see that they're moving faster, which we might expect because they've got to go um, about twice the distance. Um, yeah. Uh, I will come back and quantify that in a minute. So there's actually, uh, I'll show you in more detail later, but during this sort of time period of wound closure, uh, cell division seems to be switched off and um, it doesn't really occur uh, for some radius around, but I'll show you more detail in a bit. Um, yeah, so cell shape changes. Uh, so again, in these heat maps, uh, the blue regions are where the cells are elongated perpendicular to the wound and red would be Point towards. Uh, we've seen small wounds that only at the leading edge are these cells elongated and this quickly resolves. In the large wounds, this propagates much further back uh, and these cells still very rapidly change their shape, uh, becoming rounder within about 25 minutes. And this actually corresponds to, you can kind of split this um, change in uh, you know, rate of change of wound size here. If you did that, you, you've got kind of one gradient here, maybe sort of another regime a bit there. Um, and that corresponds to about 25 minutes when the cells have rounded up and stopped changing their shapes so much. Um, yeah. Okay, now I'll come on to uh, cell divisions. So this was the most difficult of our three cell behaviors for us to quantify. This is because we you know, image every two minutes and these cell divisions happen very rapidly within a few minutes. Um, so, you know, we only get a few frames of each of that going on, um, which meant we couldn't use or, uh, existing particle tracking algorithms to find these divisions. Um, we also have some additional difficulties from our system. Uh, we have these big, large wounds in the middle of our tissue. Uh, they have lots of debris and nucleus material that's very bright and flies around everywhere, uh, which an algorithm could mistakenly identify that as a division. We also have things like immune cells that come and move around a lot. So there's a lot of, sort of dynamic things going on that can, uh, algorithms can fall for quite easily. Uh, we also have varying ranges of quality right up to this wound edge here. Um, we get a reduced quality of our cell boundaries. This is partly um, due to the fact that e actually actually um, um, delocalizes oh yeah, delocal from the um, the boundaries to help fluidize the tissue um, and kind of let it uh, you know, more freely move. 
Um, so yeah, our algorithm's got to be able to deal with all of these constraints. So uh, once again, we turn to deep learning algorithms. Uh, and we just learned to use and um, sort of base this on uh, segmentation algorithms. So these are normally done on static images, are normally like red, green, blue images. Uh, you know, I used to then sort of identify and locate different, and, you know, classify different regions of the tissue. So into like, I don't know, cars or people or roads or whatever, you know, lots of stuff there. Um, so we thought we could maybe take advantage of this and instead of classifying into, you know, different regions of the tissue, yeah, classify different regions of the tissue into dividing and non-dividing. Um, but we don't have red, green, blue images. So we thought we'd, you know, make a dynamic red, green, blue image instead. So we have this division going on here. And then in the image below, we've taken each of those uh, nucleus channel frames, uh, colored them differently, and therefore we can reconstruct a red, green, blue image uh, from these dynamic movements here. Uh, and hopefully you can kind of see is that you get this nice uh, pattern of stripes um, in the dividing cell and the other you know, non-mitotic cells around, they are kind of gray and you know, stay stationary, so they don't really uh, show up very nicely. So we thought we could train the algorithm to find these patterns um, in our tissue. Uh, so we developed our first model, which called a UNET cell division three, we got three inputs. Uh, so we yeah, get our nice patterns here. And then wherever we find one of these patterns, we train the algorithm to put one of these white dots there. So we could then identify where and when each of these divisions occurred. Um, after training on our hand labeled data set, um, we started to get some you know, good results in the right direction. Uh, we have some true positive, false positives, where it's uh, identified what it thinks is a cell division, but there's not actually one there, and false negative, where it hasn't identified a divisions occurred. Um, so in this case, we got a, a F1 score, a kind of accuracy score um, of 0.75. Uh, oh yeah, I should have probably said earlier, one is perfect, and then going lower than that is increasingly worse. Um, so this kind of gave us clues that we might be on the right direction, but this is still far too low for us to actually use without any hand corrections or anything like that. Uh, so we decided to expand this model, increasing the amount of information inputted from these kind of three frames to this now 10 frame setup. So we have an extra time point on either side, um, but our main introduction is including the ecadherin channel here as well. This has additional information about cell divisions. It's well documented that cell boundaries round up prior to division. And then we can also see the dividing part and becoming slightly elongated uh, and undergoing cytokinesis where this new boundary is formed. So with all this extra additional information after training, uh, we got a very accurate model, which only had a few false positives and false negatives. Uh, had a very high F1 score, so we're now very happy with this uh, and can freely apply it to our data. Uh, and finally, the last deep learning model I'll tell you about um, is this uh, UNET orientation. So we're also interested in the orientations of these cells and whether they're dividing bias towards this wound or or what is the uh, you know determinant you know the main predictor of of the angle that they're going to divide in. Uh, so to do this, one, now we've already identified our cell divisions, we can zoom in on that region, take a cropped video of the same sort of dimensions, you know, five uh, with two uh, channels, um, and we can input this into our model. And instead of producing a white circle out on the other side, we've uh, made it produce a uh, oval um, with the same orientation as the cell division. Um, and we can kind of see some, uh, so these masks here are the, uh, you know, output that we uh, would desire to have. Um, and then this is the output that the model gave us. So you can see it's sort of slightly blurry around the edges, but the orientation, which we can just extract out of from this image, um, is the same, or oh, very closely the same anyway, um, highly accurate no. um, as before. Uh, and when we quantified the difference between, on our uh, testing sample, um, the difference between the orientation uh, our model gave and one that I've hand drawn and hand you know, worked out um, uh, was very small. 
was only uh, less than five degrees um, on average. Yeah. Um, so we only trained it to identify cell divisions and anything else that it saw that that was not, um, yeah, that, that they should ignore that as a, or learn that that is not a cell division. If that makes sense. Um, so yeah, like it's, uh, so the, like, this is just trained on data with wounded and unwounded, uh, samples and stuff. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, so there will be fusion in there, but it's trained to learn that that's like a non-mitotic event or, yeah, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. Uh, by simply just saying that that isn't a division um because it, right, it's a fusion event not a division event so the stuff that looks like a fusion event is trained to say that that is not a division so yeah that's kind of yeah included in the exclusion stuff yeah uh well yeah so if it had made a mistake it would come like you know and thought that that was a division then you know that would be penalized in the model and then it would be sort of uh, try and train itself to avoid saying that that's a division. Um, so, I mean, there'll be a sort of a bit of a black box. So we don't really know exactly how it's doing these things. We know that it just does it and does it very well. Um, so you just train it and then it kind of works it out itself. I don't tell it how to do anything really. I just give it lots of examples of uh, a division and non division, and it just learns the difference um, somehow. <laughs> yeah. It's all kind of, yeah, black box kind of really. So, yeah, he doesn't, don't really know details of that part. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we looked at the, uh, began by looking at the cell division orientation. Um, so here we've measured the cell divisions relative to this PD axis. Uh, so this is the long axis of the wing. We've got like the hinge over here and the blade where we're imaging in the center of. Um, so cells that divide kind of along this axis will have a low orientation. Ones that are dividing perpendicular will have one around you know, approaching 90 degrees. Um, and in all of our types of different wounds, these unwounded small and large wounds, we found that all of the cells divided slightly bias in the kind of 45 degree uh, sort of region. So that means they're dividing kind of diagonally and like that way uh, in our axis, um, which, uh, yeah, so we sort of found that. We'd expected them to be dividing along this PD axis because this hinge region um, is condensing, becoming smaller, and this has the effect of dragging the rest of the blade uh, along this, uh, yeah, the epithelium along this wing, um, stretching it out. And people have noticed that in general, across the wing, that cells are divided bias to this uh, axis, um, though the region that we zoomed in on, um, you know, that could have been different, um, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Yeah. So that data there was just collected on the region you're doing with. It's exactly. Not not over the whole. So when people have done like whole studies, they've found that on average things have been, although it actually slightly depends when I kind of drilled into the details a bit more, it depended a bit on where you were in space and where you were in time, like this changed quite a lot. Um, but anyway, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, so then we also looked at whether these cells divided bias to these uh, wounds. We found that, uh, yeah, so if a cell was dividing towards this wound, uh, it would have, you know, a bias, you know, uh, an angle, a small angle between this and the, the center of the wound. And if it was biased away, uh, it would be around 90 kind of area. Um, so we found that these, you know, when quantifying these, we found that these are pretty uniform. Uh, there's not very much difference. Uh, and it appears to be the cells are not dividing bias to this wound, uh, which again, we kind of expected that there would be a, a bias because cell divisions um can orient along tension this wound should of course sort of you know closing the wound should cause some tension pulling in um but this also could be a relatively small compared to uh, some other factors 
um, such as shape, which I'll show in a minute. Um, so after some further looking, after finding that all our orientations sort of seem to not really show uh, any bias that we kind of expected, uh, we noticed that there was actually some shuffling of these, uh, the orientation of the two daughter cells. Uh, so just after um, uh, anaphase, you know, when these have separated, um, and then if we waited 20 minutes and looked at these two daughter cells, we found that they shuff, uh, shuffled around and changed their orientation. Uh, and when we then measured this subsequent shuffling, we found that this shifted their orientation. And now that they were aligning with the global tension in the tissue, uh, so cells are now sort of more biased along this uh, PD axis, as kind of, sort of previously been shown and expected. So it's kind of nice. Um, and this happens independent on whether there was a wound there or not. Um, so we thought that this also might be the case when there's a wound there as well, that they, they're shuffling and reorient themselves along the sort of potential lines of tension drawn in from this wound. Uh, but when we did the same calculations, uh, we found that there was no bias uh, in these as well, uh, and that maybe the, the tension from the wound is relatively low to that of kind of the global, uh, the, the wing kind of uh, condensing in this corner, the hinge condensing in the corner. Uh, and finally, so there's other ideas of how um, what orients cell divisions, and that can be uh, another thing is cell shape. So as we have our two data sets of our cell divisions and our um, cell divisions and our cell shapes, we can look at these parent cells, what their shape was 20 minutes before dividing, before they would round up and just become round shapes anyway. Uh, and look at the angle of their divisions here. Um, at, you know, differ, yeah, look at the angles of division um, and correlate the two to see if, uh, wait, I'll measure the two and see if there's a, a difference between the angle that the shape was, the elongation of the shape and the division angle. Um, I've got another measure of cell shape here, which is related to the Q tensor. Um, here is, a, this is called the shape factor. Uh, at zero, at low values, these cells are very round. At uh, high values, they're very elongated. So when we look at these lower values, we found that this is kind of fairly, oh yeah, sorry, along here as well is the difference between the angle of division and the angle uh, of these uh, shapes before rounding up. Um, so yeah, these sort of are fairly uniform and don't seem to be much shifted, but as these are very round, these cells are, don't really have much of an orientation. Uh, as these cells become longer, uh, we have more of these cells uh, dividing along the similar axes um, to their uh, to their previous shape. Uh, so as this increases, so we kind of concluded that in this system, cell shape seems to be more important than local or global tension in predicting uh, cell division bias. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, sorry. So these are the, actually, I probably should crop that. There's actually no divisions <laughs> in this uh, region here. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're very, very long stretch out cells and we don't actually have any of those. So um, yeah, you can't really see, but they are just, yeah, there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah, probably should crop that. Uh, um, yeah, so from point four, so these region here, yeah, in this region, there's very few that would divide perpendicular to the shape uh, when they're very elongated. If that makes sense. If I said that right. Yeah. Um, so we think that the more the cell, the parent cell was elongated before division, um, you know, the stronger the kind of the memory. Uh, so the, yeah, so the memory of uh, the direction, yeah, the orientation of that uh, cell is, and therefore, well, actually, um, I'll start over. <laughs> um, so there's sort of two reasons why cells might divide along the long axes uh, of a shape. Um, so first is that the cell might be experiencing local tension and therefore be alonged, uh, elongated along that axis um, and therefore divide along that same axis subsequently 
And the more tension it's under, the more elongated it is. So the stronger this effect is. Um, also, there's a, another kind of point is that there are tricellular junctions. Uh, so these are where four, uh, three or four, uh, more anyway, uh, of these cell boundaries meet. So these kind of corners here. Um, in elongated cells, these are kind of clustered around the, yeah, the sort of, uh, the most sort of elongated, yeah, the sort of, hmm, I don't know what the kind of extremities of the, of the shape. Um, and these are actually where um, microtubules will um, localize and attach to to pull the um, nucleus apart. Um, so that could be reasons why that they line up along those um, line up along that same regions as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So those are just two examples for what they look like, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, in this, this example, so there's sort of one where they kind of align and then one where uh, this hasn't. So I've just chosen two kind of examples to sort of see the difference. Uh, yeah. In some sense, that one is... Close one of that one's close to zero. So yeah, so one's gonna be like this one would be like over here, and this one would kind of be like over here, or something in the graph. Just two examples. Yeah, I mean, that the peak is there. The peak is on 0, close to 0, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I don't know. So I mean, so... Use some violence, I would say that, say, why, exactly, why was it? Yeah. All right. Move on to... Um, so we can also quantify the division density around wounds. Um, and see what's going on uh, sort of temporal spatially. Uh, so we first did this with unwounded tissue just to get an idea of the general baseline of these cell divisions, uh, what was happening like normally in development. Uh, we found that these cells uh, decreased in the division density uh, linearly with time over the, the three hours. Uh, but after wounding, this was significantly uh, perturbed. So in these large wounds in green, there's a decrease in the number of divisions, uh, which dropped off to about an hour after wounding, which is uh, roughly you know, 50 minutes. It took 50 minutes for these wounds to largely close up. So during that period of time, there's a decrease in divisions. And then subsequently, um, there's this rapid increase in divisions, this synchronized burst that happens, uh, peaking about 100 and uh, so two hours after wounding. Um, and then this sort of subsequently decreases back to unwounded levels. Uh, and the same similar pattern in the small wounds uh, with this, this peak here, uh, but with no kind of drop off, particularly um, in small wounds. So you can kind of see and visualize this. So in this video, uh, you get lots of uh, white circles and these will indicate a division detected through our algorithm. So we have lots of divisions at the beginning this decreases down at very low levels. And then after this wound is closed, now we get a nice burst of these cell divisions, which then starts decreasing again and back to unwounded levels. Um, we can break this down into sort of temporal spatial heat maps. Uh, and here we're gonna compare the level of divisions that we would see in unwounded tissues. Uh, with what we see in these small and large tissues. So blue regions of these heat maps show a decrease compared to unwounded levels and red an increase. So again, we've split the tissue into different radial bands and we can look at this uh, in time. So in the small wounds, we see this small decrease in the number of divisions around the front leading edge of the wounds during wound closure and for you know, a good sort of 
uh, hour and a half afterwards. And then peaking at 100 minutes, we have this uh, synchronized burst of divisions, which occurs in a, a annulus from about 50 to 70 microns back from the wound edge. Uh, and in the large wounds, we kind of see an even stronger effect. So we get this big decrease in the divisions, which kind of extends back from the tissue kind of further outside our field of vision. Uh, and then we then get this large burst of cell divisions. Again, that this doesn't really occur in the leading edge of this now closed wound site. Uh, and the divisions are confined to a ring around this wound. Um, so we've now able to quantify these three cell behaviors around our wounds. Um, but these are all been uh, wild types and we've got our uh, Drosophila, so we can make lots of genetic knockdowns and manipulations. Um, so we can see how they, uh, different factors affect our wound. So we decided to knock down key wound healing signals uh, and see not only what happens when we knock them down on the rate of wound healing, but also which cell behaviors that they were impacting. So we did three of these. We knocked down this calcium wave. This is the first signal that's released from a wound, um, which then goes on to trigger many other responses, including the inflammatory response, which we will uh, knock down as well. Uh, and then finally, we'll knock down JNK signaling, um, which is our sort of third thing that's kind of triggered uh, by this calcium wave downstream. Uh, and is also known to be involved in wound healing. Um, to block the calcium wave, we're going to uh, express this trip RNAi. This trip will uh, the calcium channels that the the, so the calcium wave spreads through these trip calcium channels. So by expressing this RNAi, we can decrease the amount of these uh, proteins and channels in our system. We can block JNK signaling by expressing this basket, this form of basket, dominating the form basket, which blocks up and prevents uh, JNK signaling to propagate uh, and well, to, to function properly. And finally, to block or to take out the immune response, we're going to express a pro, -apt pro aptotic gene reaper uh, in the hemocytes, which are the fly's immune cells. Uh, and this will cause them to undergo apoptosis and reduce their numbers. Uh, and therefore reduce the inflammatory response. Um, so when we did this for all three uh, of our perturbations, there was a reduction in the rate of wound healing. Uh, and the most significant was in JNK signaling. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, our control takes about 50 minutes for it to close. Uh, and the JNK signaling took about 80 minutes. And we can sort of see these side by side. You'll see that this one's been very dynamic, whereas this one is, yeah, a lot less. You can see that it's kind of moving very rapidly. This is kind of gets a bit st stuck. And yeah, and this wound here is pretty much closed, uh, whereas this one is still uh, it's just about closed now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so again, we can quantify all of the three cell behaviors around each of these wounds and compare them to our controls. Uh, in this uh, calcium wave knockout uh, flies, or reduction, yeah, knockdown, um, we can see that we don't get this characteristic um, cell migration that we would in our control here. Uh, we have a low level migration, um, which doesn't happen in this kind of nice burst, uh, kind of uh, is reduced and then extends for a longer period of time. This extension is probably a uh, result of the fact that it's reduced and therefore has to migrate for a longer period of time. We also can see that the cell shape changes are slower. So in controls, as remember, this happens very rapidly within 20 minutes. Um, whereas in our uh, calcium knockouts, the cells remain elongated for a longer period of time um, before decreasing and, and rounding up. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a similar pattern of the cell divisions in the calcium knockout ones, um, but the periphery burst uh, that happens uh, is decreased in our calcium knockout ones. Uh, next are JNK signaling ones. Uh, so these JNK signaling has known to 
uh, negatively impact wound or have lack of JNK signaling is known to negatively impact wound healing. Um, it's been shown to be related to cell division and cell shape changes. Um, and that's what we see here. So we see that um, these cells remain elongated for a long period of time, uh, kind of rounding up around the kind of 80 minute mark, which is actually when these wounds close, uh, much longer than our controls. We found that the cell migration was normal. These are very similar patterns, although it doesn't really show up very here. We have a bit of a continuation of the uh, cell migration for a longer period of time, maybe as a result of fail to change their, failure to change their shapes. Uh, hasn't come out nicely on this uh, panel here, um, but in the decrease of, uh, in the reduction of these cell divisions, this sort of period here, um, this is less strong in our JNK uh, knockdowns, which has been previously noted in some other systems, um, that they lose their sensitivity to you know, damage signals uh, and continue to divide in, in other systems. And then we also see a reduction of the um, uh, proliferative burst of cell divisions as well. Uh, and finally, on our reduction of the uh, immune response, in this case, we have normal changing of cell shapes. These cells have returned to normal elongation by the sort of 20 minute mark. Uh, but in this case, cell migration appears to be reduced, uh, no longer getting this nice burst of cell, uh, now getting this nice sort of sprint of the uh, cells migrating. We get sort of very little happening here. Um, though we do get very normal uh, sort of functioning cell divisions in this scenario. Uh, so, yeah, in summary, uh, I've sort of shown you that we can quantify the three cell, uh, three main cell behaviors uh, involved in wound healing. Um, we've then quantified these three cell behaviors uh, in our other, you know, on our knockout systems, when we can attribute each of these, um, can attribute these uh I'm saying, uh, yeah, can contribute these uh, wound healing signals uh, to various uh, responses to uh, wounding. Um, and then in future work, um, sort of plans to individually target um, each of these cell behaviors. So, for example, um, have a, a, a fly line that reduces cell migration. And then we'd like to see what effects that has on. Uh, the other sub behaviors, as well as um, how long it takes for these wounds to close. Um, so, with that, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Isaac, Tani, Paul, and Helen, and everyone in the Martin and the Weavers lab as well. And thank you all for listening. Questions? Mm -hmm. So, if I understand correctly from uh, all this nice segmentation, mm -hmm. you have uh, some actual movies of uh, segmented polygonal uh, arrays. Yeah. Um, so, describing uh, probe dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have uh, nuclear tracking yeah. on top of it. Exactly, yeah. Um, so can one use this to uh, discriminate between some models? For example, you know, some mm. people, including a few of those people in this. So like room, vertex models uh, and things like yeah. that, is it? So for example, there is a vertex mm -hmm. model or there is, uh, what's it called? The Voronoi yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, model. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually, only yeah, more models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to, to leave anybody out. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> can one do can one test this? So yeah. one, one can actually tell uh, uh, so from the morphology of rearrangement mm -hmm. uh, the difference between Voronoi model or Vertex model, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you could compare the, the shapes and, you know, the you know, movements of the shapes and things like that and yeah. the fluctuations with yeah any of these models um, and, you know, maybe tune some of the properties to make them look more like mm -hmm. kind of our tissue in our system, uh, and yeah, maybe if there's a different tissue, you could maybe change Did some parameters and things like that. Uh, 
Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, we did have some stuff on the which model did we, vertex model was it or was it the Vinoidi? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we didn't do that one for the yeah this. Yeah. Okay, maybe but, uh, maybe that little question. So there there is no cell division. So presumably, when the big hole is closed, mm -hmm. the area has to come from somewhere. So you yeah. see the increase in cell area. Um, so I've tried measuring this uh, a few times, and it's not particularly clear if the um, how much yeah of an increase in area there is. I think. Um, no, how much there is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the they know the number of cells hasn't changed, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there must be that, but there's also then migration from the boundaries as well. So coming into frame, mm -hmm. so it'd obviously be you know a combination of change in area and then sort of uh, flux of new cells from the boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So I guess so. Yeah, so it sort of runs into some more sort of technical problems of. Um, I don't. I mean. So is this sure. a statement that the cell proliferation is happening uh, somewhere, perhaps not quite close to the so, world? Yeah, so I, field I, of view? I mean, so you know. I, I, I presume, so, you know, kind of, I think we'd kind of say that it's most likely that the cells are increasing in their size somewhat, um, but they're also kind of fusing together and things like this as well. So it's quite difficult to, I don't know, quantify these things because you know when cells are fusing together that is decreasing the density and decreasing the number of cells around this sort of wound uh like yeah around the area of the wound um so it's not just uh you know additional cell divisions there's also some fusion events as well which would obviously yeah decrease density in a way so can we uh, so it gets uh, quite complicated things apart a little bit so you have PIV. So is migration localized more or less uh, in the vicinity of the wound, or is it completely distributed over the whole wing? Um, so I don't have uh, any of that data outside our like frame of, zoomed in kind of frame of reference. Um, but it Why does. Why do you need to zoom in the frame of reference since you have this wonderful uh, AI? Uh, yeah. Uh, box that does everything automatically so um we have uh so we need to be sufficiently zoomed in to get kind of clear boundaries to then segment them um and we kind of played around with different so zoom zoomed in, in. Just, uh, with microscopy. yeah but, uh, so you could maybe do sort of a tiling to get a bigger exactly. thing um but then that has a another problem of a practical more practical problem rather than um that would take I might say four times as long to image uh, a single to get a movie because um, you'd have to make four different patches um, and we could do that but it means that you'd only get one uh, sample from each experiment which is very which would then be very time consuming and to to generate the data so you, so you definitely could do it uh, I just haven't done that because that would be you know take a very long time <laughs> to get the same kind of data Uh, are you aware of Shane Hudson from Vanderbilt's uh, recent preprint um, oh, yeah. focusing on wood fusion, uh, self fusion? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, I haven't seen that one. I think I think I've seen some, but I don't. I don't recognize the name, so I don't think it was their work. But I don't. I'm not sure. I um, think adding your work to theirs might mm. be very interesting. Were, were they looking in the Drosophila adult abdomen? Is it in the... I don't know. I don't think it's a wing. I... And, uh, there was one where they... Uh, the, I, I, I could be a different group, I'm not sure. But one where they looked at um, yeah, cell fusion in adult um, abdomens. Um, but I, I don't remember the, the name of the group that did that. Uh, maybe. Oh, wait, yeah, Paige McCall. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I'll look at the figures, maybe I, I might recognize it. Yeah, yeah. So, what was the role of the burst in 
um, cell divisions after the wound healing? Is it to fill in the area? Yeah, so we kind of um, assume that it's there's like a uh, yeah, as the you know cells kind of presumably would have increased in size potentially, or you know to to cover up this space or you know, fused and all these kind of things. Um, that the cell divisions are then to kind of recover that lost, um, yeah, cells from that have died in the wound, right? And, and also, you had this background decrease in cell division rate. Was yeah. that duty, or is it? That's just, just because normal part of development. That is, that's just what happens if you just you know don't do anything. Just just image the 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 wing. So there's sort of cycles of divisions, uh, and we're kind of starting our imaging towards the end of one of those cycles um so that it's kind of just like tailing off if you image a bit early it's kind of loads of it so yeah that kind of type of thing cool. thanks mm -hmm. uh yeah so you have um so not particularly during the wound healing process um so much well i don't really see it then the, i think i've you know spotted maybe one or two occasionally seeing some extravating cells or they you can essentially lose their apical surface anyway um i can't see any further down um, um but what we do see so yeah it seems to be very little of that in this system um, um but what we do see is the cells that fuse together they kind of form a big kind of cluster of you know, sort of five or six of these large, you know, uh, yeah, polynucleated cells. Um, and so sort of long after the wound is closed in kind of five, six hours afterwards, they start to extravate away or sometimes they divide, but mostly they kind of seem to be extravating out of the tissue. Yeah. But they're kind of only a few big cells that do that. So, yeah. This might be a silly question, but what's extravating? Is that like buckling? Uh, so that's where the cells um, remove themselves from the, the the single layer of epithelium in this case. Um, so they kind of close off their top boundary and fall away into the wing, and then they'll and normally be eaten up by an amine cell or something like that. Yeah. Mm 